Hey there, last time I celebrated the continued success of Tunisia's system of representative government. It's the most complete success from the Arab Spring so far, and for the past nine years, it has been smashing stereotypes of what Arab and Muslim countries are capable of. But many commentators question whether Tunisia can really provide an example for the rest of the region. Today we'll ask whether or not Tunisia is just too different to provide any useful lessons to the Arab world. First off, let's address the concern that would be dominating the comments section if this video focused on Algeria. Many in North Africa insist that they are not Arabs, but members of the ethnic group known as the Berbers, or Amazia. This indigenous population was there long before the Arabs came, 1400 years ago, and the majority of Tunisians are descended from the Amazia people to some degree. This is important to talk about, but I don't think it makes Tunisia that different from the other countries in the region. Despite the propaganda efforts of a century's worth of Arab nationalists, it's not like any other country in the region is pure Arab either, whatever that might mean. Maybe some of the Gulf countries are, but even there I would be suspicious. All of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa are a bewildering mix of peoples. But there are a lot of things that do make Tunisia different. One of the most important is its extraordinary durability as a political unit. Many countries in the region had their borders forced upon them by European imperialists as little as a hundred years ago. Well, Tunisia's borders were also defined by invaders, but those invaders were Roman. And those borders are 2,000 years old, not just a hundred or so. There's been expansion and contraction since, but there are portions of the modern Tunisian border that date back to Scipio and Hannibal. Tunisia has been subject to invasion after invasion, but its small geographical size and consistency as a unit means that these changes have tended to affect most of the country equally, rather than leave different contending cultural pockets. 99% of the country practices, or doesn't practice, one type of Sunni Islam. In many colonized countries, the European language was limited to an elite. Some writers claim that French had a much wider impact in Tunisia than elsewhere. This high degree of unity helped Tunisia have a less damaging experience of French imperialism than most. The first Tunisian constitution dates back to 1861, 20 years before the French took over. They also abolished slavery in 1846, long before France or the United States. Throughout the French protectorate era, Tunisia was able to hold on to its own monarchy that nominally had to be respected. This made the politics much more complicated for the French. They'd signed treaties with this guy. So Tunisia was always in a somewhat better bargaining position than most other colonized countries. This brought more benefits for Tunisia. Like their constitutional history, elements of Tunisia's modern education system also date back to the 19th century. Tunisia's strength allowed them to better resist the French, but paradoxically, this made them more open to European influence. Kicking the French out didn't require as much time and violence as it did in Algeria, so there wasn't as much bitterness. Even directly after independence, Habib Bourguiba, the country's first dictator, was happy to work closely with the capitalist West, making Tunisia one of the richer Arab countries, even though it didn't have much oil. Tunisia's location, close to Malta and Sicily, has prompted many to see it as as much of a southern European country as an Arab one. Tunisia was run by dictators from independence in 1956 to 2011, but they were fairly benevolent dictators, and they ruled through their own security and police force, instead of Tunisia's small and delightfully non-political army. To sum up, Tunisia has a lot of advantages. It's easy to see why representative institutions emerged there before they did anywhere else in the Arab world. But do all these advantages mean that it's silly to expect other Arab countries to be able to pull off something similar? I don't think so. In fact, Tunisia's leading position makes me think of a European country that you might have gotten sick of hearing me talk about. The United Kingdom was also a trendsetter when it came to representative institutions. A civil war and a bloodless revolution in the 1600s gave them a strong parliament, while the rest of Christendom was still struggling under absolute despots. It took a while, but representative government spread from the UK to the rest of the European world. And the UK was just as different from its neighbors as Tunisia is. 
Tunisia has an almost uniquely stable population and ancient borders. The United Kingdom is an island. Tunisian Islam has many unique elements. England literally has its own version of Christianity. Tunisia is richer and better educated than a lot of the Arab world. That was true of the UK as well, but the gap between the British and the rest of Europe was much, much larger. I could go on. Again and again in world history, we see one country in a region take the lead because of a number of advantages. Their success makes it clear what is possible, and they blaze a path for others to follow. The United Kingdom did it for Europe. Japan did it for Asia. The Arab world now has its own leader in democratization. That's a fantastic thing. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. And if you're feeling generous this holiday season, why not sign up to help keep this YouTube channel going by checking out the crowdfunding thing at the Patreon link here. Thank you and have a happy new year.